Good morning and uh, welcome to our Bible study uh, here that's going to be offered here this morning. Uh, we're going to uh, be taking a look at a section from the book of Mark and really, really where we left off um, the last time that we met. Um, and then we're going to go down a, maybe a little bit different uh, path uh, with recent events and things that have been going on um, in regards to um, this um, this text and uh, try to expand it a little bit and um, uh, maybe be able to see some of the things that are going on in our world in uh, light of Scripture. Uh, that's what I want to encourage us to be uh, as Christians, is people who look at the world through the lens of Scripture, not through our political lens, not through our um, cultural lens um, through the lens of our uh, of the Word of God. And of course, um, we have to understand that we all bring things to the table uh, that we need to be aware of in how we see the world. Um, but my encouragement is for us to see the world via the Word of God. Um, today we're looking at uh, chapter 7 of the Gospel of Mark. I'm really only going to deal with a few verses today. We're going to pick up kind of where I left off last time um, as Jesus now makes his way into a Gentile territory. Um, so we're going to pick up in verse 24. So 7 verse 24 is where we will go. I'll read the entire section uh, for us. It should be here on your screen um, and then we'll uh, dig in a little bit. And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and he entered a house and did not want anyone to know. Yet he could not be hidden, but immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit of heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile and a Seraphonician by birth. And she begged him not to ca or begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter, and he said to her, "Let the little child let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs." But she answered him, "Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs." And he said to her, "For this statement, you may go your way." The demon has left your daughter, and she went home and found the child laying in bed, and the demon gone. So we have uh, here um, a section of Jesus, um, again, interacting with the Gentile territory. Um, if we remember, we've just come out of a section in the Gospel of Mark that talks about things that are clean and unclean, what makes someone unclean. Um, and then, of course, uh, prior uh, to that, we, we, we saw uh, things, um, the rebuking of uh, the, the Pharisees and uh, the traditions that they had been elevated. Um, and, and so we see all of these things. Uh, and now Jesus interacting with uh, the people, uh, the Gentile people, specifically uh, this woman. Um, in the region of Tyre and Sidon. Uh, we'll come back to that uh, in a moment. Um, and so we see, though, Jesus is in this territory, and the text itself says um, that he did not want anyone to know, uh, or to come around. He desired uh, to be hidden, and it says he could not be hidden. So, uh, Jesus here, why that is uh, not fully displayed in the text. We know, of course, um, that uh, the theme running, one of the themes running through Mark is uh, that uh, Jesus uh, tells people not to tell, and yet they go and tell. Um, and the kind of, we've been talking about how um, oftentimes uh, the works of uh, Jesus, the um, foretaste of the uh, reign of God on earth. Um, people wanted the benefits of that without understanding the deeper mission and what Jesus had come to do. Uh, yes, he came to restore. Yes, he came to heal. Yet he did not come to uh, rule as a king uh, and simply heal. Rather, he came to die uh, for the sins of the world 
and bring about um, bring about the atonement of people's sin uh, and call people to repentance and turn uh, to him. So that's his mission. And so there's all of those things wrapped up into he didn't want to be known, as well as perhaps he's just tired. Um, sometimes we we forget Jesus is a human being. He is he is human just like you and I. Um, he needed to sleep. He needed to rest. He needed to do those things because he is human. Just because he is also divine does not negate his uh, human uh, needs and uh, ability, abilities and, and things along those lines. And so we have to keep that in mind. Maybe he was just tired. Maybe he didn't want to uh, be dealing or just needed to step back. And yet people found him. He could not be hidden. The text goes on, but immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell at his feet. So remember, we just have come out of things that, uh, of the section about things that are clean and unclean. And now we see this woman who comes to Jesus with a daughter who has an unclean spirit. The text is very clear. This daughter has an unclean spirit. Remember, he's in Gentile territory. This daughter is outside the kingdom of God. She is outside the kingdom of God. She is unclean. She has this unclean spirit. And so we, we, we don't like to talk about things in that way oftentimes, but if we don't, we miss what's going on. She had an unclean spirit. She was outside God's kingdom, yet Jesus was going to act eventually. After some discussion, uh, we, she would, or that Jesus would act on behalf of uh, this Gentile woman and this Gentile daughter. Um, and we see, again, a foretaste of the feast of People from all walks of life, all across the world, coming together as the body of Christ to worship God in truth and in spirit. And so um, the text, so she says, it is, says that she falls down. And this, of course, is a, uh, a posture of pleading, of requesting, of I have nothing, you have what I need type of posture. And so she is clearly uh, displaying that. Uh, in her uh, posture towards Jesus. Uh, now the woman was a Gentile, a Seraphonician by birth. Um, that's not an inconsequential point. It's not a just a throwaway uh, line there. Why is the uh, text, why is the Word of God identifying uh, this uh, where uh, her, identi her identity by birth. And we're going to talk about more, more of this in a little while. Um, but so she's a Seraphonician by birth. She's also, or it is also said that Jesus is in the region of Tyre and Sidon. And so this is going to bring us back to uh, the Old Testament as we um, uh, take a look. Uh, hopefully I can find it here. Um, oh, that's not what I'm looking for. Um, but we have uh, an Old Testament character uh, by the name of, perhaps you would recognize it, Jezebel. Jezebel is Seraphonician. She is from Tyre and Sidon. She is connected to this location. She is the one in the Old Testament that uh, marries Ahab, who is the seventh king of the northern kingdom of Israel. And her marriage is, is one of political advantage. So this marriage is a political arrangement. And what we know from times such as these, where there's a king and there's princesses and princesses, and, and you, you marry uh, into one another's family, there's an ascent. There's a there's a, a linking between countries or 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 states or how whatever you want to define them as. There's a linking there, so that there's less likelihood of war between those two because now there's a family uh, connection. There's a family tie, uh, and 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 that's why it was done. So it was politically advantageous uh, for Ahab uh, to marry Jezebel. 
But what ends up happening is Jezebel is a pagan. She is not a worshiper of God. Rather, she is a worshiper of Baal. And so she introduces Baal worship into the people of Israel and leads them down a path of apostasy, of idolatry. And this is what 1 Kings 16, verse 30, says about Ahab. Though he was in some ways a successful king, this is what the text says about him. He did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. Why? Because he allowed for his marriage, his politically advantage, advantage uh, marriage, to then introduce false worship into the people of God. And this is what we see time and time again in the Old Testament. We see the, the, those outside of God's kingdom, those outside of the covenant relationship, if they are welcomed in, they oftentimes introduce false worship into the people of God and destroy the people of God through their apostasy and through their idolatrous worship. So it is a tragic thing uh, that we witness here. Now back to the Gospel of Mark. This woman is from the same place. She is of the same descendant uh, line. And so here we see Jesus now interacting with this woman, and she will actually cast out the un or he will cast out the unclean spirit. And that is not inconsequential. This person outside the kingdom of God, possessed by an unclean spirit, will have that removed by Jesus. So listen to what uh, Jesus first says, Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now, uh, we must remember um, that what Jesus here is saying is said also by the Apostle Paul um, in a very uh, famous verse that uh, is oftentimes quoted. Um, but the first part is what most people remember, um, and the first part is very important. But we forget um, here um, sometimes the last line. And the last line is not to make light of um, our own salvation as non-Jewish people, uh, but rather it is to help us understand how God, in fact, brought in uh, the gospel to the world. And so it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For it is the righteousness of God revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So the Jew first, and then also to the Greek. Now, using Greek here, uh, using the Greek, that phrase there, um, is an indication of those who are not Jewish, so the Gentile people. Um, and, and dealing Paul in a, in a Greek context uses that term uh, to identify uh, the non-Jew. Um, but here in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus says the exact, exact same thing. Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Her response, though, her response is, But she answered him, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her from this statement, You may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in the bed, in bed and the demon gone. So she understands in some way that, yes, this is the Jewish Messiah. Yes, this is a, a Jewish teacher. Yes, this is a person connected to the Jews, yet even those around will have crumbs uh, to feed on. An amazing statement. An amazing statement by this one who was outside looking in in many ways. An amazing statement. Yet even in her statement, even in her statement of faith, she sees God in too small of a fashion. 
she sees that only the crumbs will fall to her. When in reality, when in reality, she will be able to feast on a full meal. You see, the crumbs of God are not small crumbs. The crumbs of God are rather abundance, a full meal. Just take, for example, what we have just read in, in previous sections of the Gospel of Mark. When Jesus feeds the 5,000, the Jewish people, when he feeds the 5,000 in the Jewish context, what is left over? Baskets and baskets and baskets of crumbs. The Jewish people will eat. The Jewish people will feast. But there will be enough for all people to feast, all people to eat. And as we move forward in the Gospel of Mark, we'll even see that come out as Jesus then moves into the feeding of the 4,000 in a Gentile context. Now it's not only simply crumbs that are left over, rather it is a full meal given directly by God himself, Jesus Christ. And so we see, we see the fullness of God's gospel coming to the Jews and also coming to the Gentiles. And what a picture this truly is. So an amazing uh, scene here. And so what I want to do now, though, is try to unpack this in an even deeper way um, and perhaps dealing with some of the uh, things that we are uh, seeing go on in our world and some of the, the challenging conversations that we are either having or not having or avoiding or whatever it might be. Um, and I'm going to probably step onto some ice that uh, I'm not overly confident in, in regards to, I want to be very careful, I want to be very measured with my words, but I want to help us try to look at the world through the lens of Scripture, not through the lens of the cultural manuge that we swim in and live in every single day. So we're going to do that here in a moment. All right, we're going to continue um, by taking a look at uh, Ephesians chapter 2. And if, I, if you've uh, spent any time uh, reading your Bible, studying your Bible, you're probably thinking, oh, Ephesians chapter 2, that's a, a wonderful section. And, and perhaps you could even start uh, reciting that section of Scripture that you, that you have committed to memory from Ephesians chapter 2. And... Most likely, uh, we could all start by saying, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing in the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's oftentimes the focus, and, and, and many times the focus or a reminder for us is we, of course, are saved by faith. Uh, there is no doubt about that. And even that faith is a gift from God um, that we receive through holy baptism, that we receive through the word of God. Um, that, is, uh, that is a gift. It is a gift of faith. It is not even our own work of faith. It is simply, purely, 100% gift. And then we also confess that that then goes on to um, conform us into the image of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and that um, in our faith, in that gift of faith, we then go on to do the good works that he has put before us, that he has established for us to do, which says God pre prepared beforehand uh, that we should walk in them, we should walk in those good works according to our faith. I'll be honest, that's usually where we stop. Um, that's usually um, where people stop reading. Um, some will even say, well, we'll just stop after verse 9 and we won't even talk about the works stuff or the good works stuff. But we need to confess both of those things. But what I want to take a moment to do tonight or today uh, is to look at what follows. And what I want to, and I want to make a few points in regards to what follows. 
The text says, beginning in verse 11, Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at one time separated from Christ, alienated from the common wealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Now, But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in the flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he may he might create in himself one new man in the place of two so that making peace he might reconcile us both to god in one body through the cross therefore killing hostility and he came and preached peace to those who were far off and peace to those who were near. For th through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are being built together into a dwelling for God by the Spirit. So I want to take a moment and unpack this a little bit in relationship to what we just got done looking at in the Gospel of Mark. Remember, this woman was a non-Jew. She was not Jewish. And oftentimes our, our mind, our, our mind immediately runs to the fact, well, Jewish, we think of Jewish as a race of people. And of course there is some um, biological components to who the Jewish people were. But what does the text say that a, or, or alludes to the fact that the Jewish people were a people of the covenant. They were the chosen people of God. There was a divine establishment of the people of God and who they were and then everybody else. This was divinely put into place. This was divine in its nature. The Jewish people were the chosen people of God. Not because of what they had done, simply because of what God had done and declared and promised. This was established. And so sometimes when we look at these Jewish, non-Jewish uh, details in the Bible, our immediate mind, or our immediate thought runs to ethnic understanding of those terms. But the terms need to first and foremost be understood in the context of the covenant that was made with those people. These were divinely established orders. These were divinely put up things. These were divine revelations in the Old Testament. That these were the chosen people of God and that through whom salvation would come to the world. Okay? Okay. And this is what is undone by Jesus. When Jesus says that there is no Jew nor Greek, or when the scriptures say, so the word of Jesus, it's all the word of God, says there are neither no Jew nor Greek, it's not, talking, it's not really talking about what we oftentimes talk about as race. It's talking about those who are in the covenant promise and those who are outside the covenant promise. In relate, And now that if you are in Christ, you are one. There's no distinguishing in relationship with Christ. There's no Jewish Christian and non-Jewish Christian. They are not to be separated. They are one in Christ. 
And this is what Christ broke down. This is what Christ removed. This is what his death and resurrection has introduced to the world, is that in Christ we are one. Okay? So the relay or the the interaction between Jesus and this non-Jewish woman is more than she's not Jewish by birth or by race or however you want to define it. It's that she is outside the covenant relationship as established by God. This is what Jesus breaks down. This is what Jesus removes, and this text in, in Ephesians is talking exactly about that. He came to bring peace. He came to bring unity. He came to build the people of God as one. Other places in Scripture talk about one body, one whatever it might be. And over the past weeks, I, I couldn't tell you how long it's been now, there has been a lot of conversation uh, of, of race relations of, of, uh, and all of those things that are wrapped up into that. The people of God need to understand that we are to stand against all forms of injustice, but we need to be very careful how we talk about those things. The people of God need to be against racism, for we are one in Christ. Okay? We need to, though, be careful how we talk about that. You see, if I have committed racial bias or harm against a brother, specifically a brother in Christ or a sister in Christ, I need them to say, you have done this to me, you have done this injustice to me, that I may be convicted by the Holy Spirit and that I may be forgiven by the blood of Jesus and by my brother or sister in Christ. We need to be very careful how we talk about these things. Because if we begin to talk about things in blanket terms, what does, what does repentance look like? What does forgiveness look like? The Christian looks for injustices. The Christian looks to pour out mercy. The Christian looks to help the downtrodden, the fatherless, the widow, the orphan. That is the duty of a Christian. And if we sin against someone, we must confess our sins to both them and to God. Things are not very cut and dry sometimes. But the whole point of me talking about this is to draw your attention to the fact that the church, the church is one in Christ. Perhaps there are times where the church has not always acted in accordance with by church, I mean the people of God have not always acted in accordance with who we are. But my question is, is Jesus able to heal those wounds? Or does something else have to happen? Is Jesus able to direct our attention to the injustices and give us guidance on how we as God's people can act? Or does something else have to do that? These terms of, 
of racism and things like that are being thrown out and I wholeheartedly state racism is sin. Racism is an ugly sin. It has no place in the people of God. But how the picture is being framed right now, it becomes very difficult to confess sins. So I want us to encourage one another to take heart in Jesus. If there is sin within our heart, that we confess that to him. And we plead for him to give us guidance through his word and how we act with one another. Because it is only through Christ that hostility will be put away. Not through programs, not through societal measures, not through any of those. It is only through Christ that hostility will be put away. And I, I'm, I don't do that we can unlearn our sins. Sin needs to be dealt with by a Savior. Sin needs to be dealt with by the blood of Jesus. Sin needs to be dealt with through repentance and forgiveness. And so I want to uh, encourage us to be very careful how we speak about things and also acknowledge the pain and hurt that many people are feeling, many who are part of the body of Christ and many who are not part of the body of Christ. But may we have compassion, may we have patience, may we have um, humility in how we approach these things because those are in accordance with the Spirit. Those are gifts of the Spirit. But let us never waver that the only healing that will ever come is through the gospel, is through Jesus our Lord. I don't know if I hit as things as well as I wanted to this morning. I hope this maybe is helpful for the few people who watch it. If you have questions, I'd love to have conversations. I'd love to talk. I'd love to kick around different things. I pray that we as God's people might be those who proclaim and who live out the gospel in our lives. May Jesus go with you today.